Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Featherstone, and I'm the director of the Hellenic Observatory here at the London School of Economics, and it's my pleasure to be hosting this evening's uh, event. I'm going to introduce our speakers uh, in a moment, but by way of introduction to our focus, uh, let me uh, say a few words on that. You'll have seen that we're here to discuss a parallax. That is a set of events which is seen very differently by two opposing sides. And 1922 represented traumatic events uh, as seen from uh, both Greece and Turkey, but in distinct uh, fashions. Seen from the vantage points of the Greeks, uh, we refer to the 1922 catastrophe, the burning of Smyrna in September 1922, the 9th of September, and its aftermath. In order to convey the significance of the event for Greeks, let me read uh, to you the introduction from a book uh, published in 2008 by Giles Milton, Paradise Lost. On Saturday, the 9th of September, 1922, the victorious Turkish cavalry rode into Smyrna, the richest and most cosmopolitan city in the Ottoman Empire. Smyrna's vast wealth had been created by powerful Levantine dynasties, many of them British, that had lived in the city for two centuries. They helped to create a majority Christian city that was unique in the Isla Isla Islamic world. To the Turks, Smyrna had always been the infidel city. In the aftermath of the First World War, Greece invaded Turkey with the aim of restoring a Christian empire in Asia Minor, with Smyrna at its heart. The great powers, including Britain, supported Greece's war on Turkey. By 1922, the Greeks had been vanquished. Many feared that the newly victorious Turkish army would now unleash a terrible fury on Smyrna's infidel inhabitants. Conquering Islamic armies were traditionally granted three days of pillage following the capture of a resisting city. Yet there had been no resistance to the Turks and Smyrna's Christian population, which included Levantines, Europeans and Americans, were confident the Allied fleet in the bay would protect them. What happened over the next two weeks must rank as one of the most compelling human dramas of the 20th century. Almost two million people were victims of a disaster of truly epic proportions. The withdrawal of uh, Greek forces from Smyrna or Izmir was followed, of course, the following year by the Treaty of Lausanne of 1923 and its uh, compulsory exchange of populations. An exchange of populations defined by their religious identity, Greek Orthodox in Turkey or Muslims in Greece. There were defined exceptions. The treaty did not involve Greeks in Constantinople or Turks in Western Thrace in the exchange. The results of uh, the Treaty of Lausanne uh, was that the overwhelming majority of Greek speakers in the world were now citizens of the Greek state a state created out of revolution just a hundred years uh, beforehand. But there were major new challenges. One and a half million refugees from Asia Minor took up residence in Greece, creating new suburbs around major cities uh, like Athens, near Smyrna, etc. But Turkey, 1922, represents the culmination of Mustafa Kemal's campaign to drive the Greeks from Anatolia and to create a new nation. He had repudiate, repudiated the Treaty of Ser of 1920, which had humiliated the Sultan and had greatly reduced the territory of the Ottoman Empire. Kemal had recently assumed responsibility for the war against the Greeks, and he initiated a new offensive to push the Greeks to the sea at Izmir. Within months of the Greek defeat, the Sultanate was abolished, and the following year, the Republic of Turkey uh, was born in October 23. A modern nationalism was born, Kemalism, uh, which would guide the nation building 
in uh, the Republic of Turkey. So we're discussing the events and the anniversary, uh, the relevance of history, memory, and the outcome for international politics uh, in the hundred years since those events. And I'm delighted to welcome our speakers. This evening, we're welcoming speakers just from three continents. Um, and uh, let me introduce them in the order that they will be speaking to us. We've invited each of them, whether here in situ or online, to speak to us for uh, a maximum of eight minutes. And then we'll have uh, a discussion and we'll certainly encourage you to uh, ask questions here, those of you in the audience, uh, in this room. And we're also inviting you watching online uh, to send us your questions as well. Uh, my colleague here sat next to me, Yorgos Yalakopoulos, is a lecturer in modern history at the City University of London. He's also the coordinator of the Global 1922 Project. He is a member of the Royal Historical Society and he serves in the executive committees of the Modern Greek Studies Association in the UK and the Greek Politics Specialist Group of the PSA. Ozan Ozavchi is Assistant Professor of Transimperial History. His research interests are in the entangled histories of Europe, the Middle East and North Africa from the late 18th century until the 1950s. In his new monograph, Dangerous Gifts, Imperialism, Security and Civil Wars in the Levant, 1798-1864, he analyzes the genealogy of Western armed interventionism in the Ottoman Levant in the long 19th century. He's currently writing his third monograph, provisionally entitled The Invention of the Eastern Question, International Law, Capitulations and Security in the Embassies of Sir Robert Liston. In his previous research, he's investigated the idea of liberty in the Middle East and the Caucasus, which resulted in the publication of his first book, Intellectual Origins of the uh, Republic. Yanis Grigoriadis is an associate professor and Jean Monnet Chair of U uh, European St Studies at Bill Kent University, senior fellow and head of the program on Turkey at the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy, uh, popularly known as LEMEP, editor-in-chief of the Southeast European and Black Sea Studies uh, Journal. He has published extensively on Greek and Turkish politics and history, and is a member of the Home Across, a European Research Council-funded research project exploring space, memory, and the legacy of the 1923 population exchange between Greece and Turkey. Elizabeth Thompson is a historian of social movements and liberal constitutionalism in the Middle East, with a focus on how race and gender relations have been conditioned by foreign intervention and international law. She recently published her third book, How the West Stole Democracy from the Arabs, the Syrian Arab Congress and the Destruction of its Historic Liberal Islamic Alliance, published in 2020. It explores how and why Arabs gathered in, the, in Damascus after World War I to establish a democratic regime, in contrast to the prevalence of authoritarian nationalist regimes established elsewhere in the lands of the defeated Ottoman and Habsburg empires. The book also considers the long-term negative consequences of the destruction of the Arab democracy authorized by the Paris Peace Conference and enforced by the new League of Nations. Uh, and finally, but not least, my colleague Yaprak Gersoy is the Chair of Contemporary Turkish Studies at the European Institute here at the LSE. She's worked on Greek and Turkish politics from a comparative perspective with a special interest in regime change and civil military relations in both countries, including the period after the Lausanne Treaty and the exchange of populations. More recently, Yaprak's project on Turkey-UK relations was funded by the British Institute at Ankara, and this new research area of research has led her to explore Turkish perceptions of the UK and the impact of emotions on uh, international relations and politics. So welcome to each of you. Can I just test that everyone can uh, hear us? Uh, those of you 
joining the speakers joining online perhaps you could just um signal wave that you can see and hear is okay wonderful we're off to a, a brilliant start uh so the parallax and uh, uh george over to you well thanks kevin and and uh, thanks for the invitation and, the, the, and very good to see good colleagues and friends and, and people uh, here. Uh, uh, I'm a historian of international relations and I'm working on imperial transitions, dissolutions of empires, imperialism, nationalism, and how they play out in uh, uh, southeastern Europe and in Britain. So from this perspective, I just want to offer some introductory comments. I'll keep to my eight minute <coughs> pledge and I'll touch on some of you know, your introductory remarks. Uh, just apologies, I'm reading from my phone. Uh, Again, yeah, to, to, to situate us in, in time and place, like this month, a century ago, delegates from Europe's great powers, in other words, the victors of Versailles, gathered in the Swiss city of Lausanne to discuss the, the future of the Near and Middle East. Uh, the greco turkish War of 1919 to 1922 had just come to an end. Uh, the victory of the Turkish nationalist movement meant the defeat of the Greek expansionist project, the paradox, you know, uh, view, as we said. And that defeat, as Kevin mentioned, came with great catastrophe. Uh, and it's not only the annihilation of the city port of Smyrna, obviously, it is a destruction of the regions of Asia Minor's as Christian populations. Uh, the end of the Greek Turkish war brought to an end what many scholars have referred to as the greater war decade. A decade, a decade, not four years, of war destruction and humanitarian challenges, starting with the Balkan Wars and ending in Asia Minor. And I think this is a useful frame to think of these events that we're discussing today. Uh, to the extent that the Greek-Turkish War brings the decade of the greater war to an end, the Lausanne peace process marks the end of the lengthy period as well of peacemaking, a period that starts in 1919 in Versailles, ends in Lausanne, and in the meantime, we have interesting cities that some of us know a bit about, others don't know much about, uh, Saint-Germain, Trianon, Neuilly, and Sever, obviously. Uh, but 1922 not only marks the end of the Greek-Turkish War. To properly understand the parallax of 1922, I argue, we need to place the Asia Minor events in the wider context of imperial transitions and global world making. And 1922 is a flashpoint for this, a year that catalyzes developments that will shape the dynamics of the interwar period. Let's consider a couple of pointers, a couple of examples. Uh, the culmination of the Russian Civil War with the emergence formerly of the Soviet Union, rage and humanitarian crisis in Central and Eastern Europe, Con conferences deciding the security in the Pacific, uh, failed attempts to integrate Weimar Germany and Soviet Russia in the new international system, nationalist and pan-nationalist movements challenging the legitimacy of Western imperial rule in the emerging Middle East. For instance, Egypt, 1922 is important for Egypt in some ways. So essentially, we're talking about a period in time and a symbolic year of world making, but world making that happens not only in conferences of rooms and hotels, the Lausanne conference lasts six months, right? But it happens in various sites with various actors involved in them. Now, seen in this broader canvas, the Greek expansionist veteran Anatolia is something I would argue more than an act of defense and protection of Christian populations. International historians do not dispute its imperial dimension, but, but it would be reductionist to argue that the complex story of greco turkish entanglement uh, is a simple story of an imperialist attack provoking a nationalist reaction. I'm not arguing that. Uh, what I would say sounds a bit abstract, but in the history of the region, the imperial and the national are really mutually constitutive. And that's something that we should always bear in mind. But now, leaving the national, leaving the imperial, let's turn to the international aspect as we move on from 1922 to 1923 and the Lausanne. 
The process of peacemaking in Lausanne lasted six months, as I said earlier. It culminated in the formal recognition of an independent Turkey state. Among other things, it's a complex treaty, it's a lot of things are going on. Um, one of Lausanne's lasting legacies uh, was the formal compulsory population exchange, as Kevin mentioned, between Greece and Turkey. The new international order in the region, I argue, was crafted with materials from the past. Population exchanges and partitions have already, had already occurred and had already been proposed in the past on a number of occasions, and not only during the Balkan Wars. Uh, suffice to note that the chairperson in Lausanne, the British imperial policymaker, Lord Curzon, was the architect of the partition of Bengal in the 1900s. Uh, or another example is a more familiar Greek-Bulgarian population exchange during the Balkan Wars, or even negotiations between Greece and Turkey in 1914 before the beginning of the war about a potential population exchange in some of the Aegean islands. Um, so essentially what I am arguing is that Lausanne turned the practice of population transfers into an instrument of international politics and into a core feature of the interwar liberal international order. Um, and a side note here, in the 1920s, a lot of internationalists associated with the League of Nations found the involuntary population exchange as a useful tool in international politics. Um, now, the Lausanne Treaty is not the only treaty, uh, it's actually, is, no, the Lausanne Treaty is the only treaty of the period that survives to this very day. Uh, was it a departure from the Paris and Geneva centered international order? Did it mark, in other words, the beginnings of a revisionism that eventually led to the challenge of the Versailles Treaty, as some historians claim, because it revisioned the, the provisions of the Severn Treaty? Um, I would argue that the Lausanne Treaty was the logical conclusion of a new international system built in Paris and Geneva, the center of the League of Nations. And this system, put population politics and the pursuit of national homogeneity at its front and center. And this is a legacy that has shaped 20th century. And dare I say, shadows of this legacy, we even find it today in conflicts across the world. Consider for instance, the use of uh, some referenda as a means of, you know, we find, see it in Ukraine, in the Russian action as a means of gaining territory, et cetera. Uh, now, coming to the end closely, uh, beyond the offices of the decision makers, beyond the halls of the international conventions and the theaters of formal warfare, like the people, lie the people, the civilian populations, who after all suffer the consequences of the remaking of international order, of the collapse of empires, or the dissolution of imperial fantasies, and the pursuit of strategies of national homogenization. And scholars arduously excavate their stories. And we have a lot of scholarship on, you know, memories, the experiences, and, and you know, like, you know, bottom-up approaches in trying to think about this, uh, uh, the, the people and their sufferings. And, and that's my final point, this process of uncovering sometimes reveals inconvenient truths in both sides of the region. So I think on that point, I should end it here, and thanks for... Thank you, Jorgen, very much. Uh, Ozan. Uh, and Ozan is joining us. Uh, joining us from the Netherlands. From the Netherlands, from Utrecht. Thank you. Yes, greetings from the Netherlands, from Utrecht. Uh, I'd like to begin my eight minutes by thanking the organizers for putting together this wonderful panel and very nice to see familiar faces. A long while ago, when Yorgos and I were thinking about the, the title of this panel, we decided to include the term parallax in it, in part to emphasize the intersubjective dynamics and implications of 1922. Clearly, as said before, what was a defeat and catastrophe for the Greeks, as Yorgos has just mentioned, it was a victory for the Turks. But instead of war and catastrophe and victory or the, the great fire, I'll talk about the peace that 1922 brought about. 
the Lausanne Peace Conference that Yorgos has just spoken of became a host to many exciting figures, prominent figures or not so well-known figures like the newly elected Italian president, uh, Premier, uh, Prime Minister Benito Mussolini, who made his diplomatic debut in Lausanne, or the likes of Bulgarian Nadezhda Stanchova, one of the first women diplomats in history. She was also there at Lausanne and the negotiating tables. She would tell people around that if you open my heart, you would see the Dutch, which shows how badly the Bulgarians wanted an outlet in the Aegean. Or young Ernest Hemingway was also there in Lausanne. He was a Paris-based journalist at the time. He spent three weeks at Lausanne observing the conference. And later on, he even wrote a poem about his experience there and in Genoa and earlier in Istanbul. The poem's title is, They All Made Peace. What is peace? This is also the title of a volume that I'm co-editing uh, together with my colleague, Professor Jonathan Conlin of Southampton University. Uh, the volume is about the Lausanne Peace Conference and will come out next spring with Kinko. In its introduction, we ask the very question that Hemingway raises. What did peace mean in 1922? Did it involve settling past scores or trying to establish an international order that would prevent future outbreaks of violence at whatever cost to present and past? Or as Martin Luther King Jr. has once inquired, was peace merely the absence of tension or the presence of justice? The many participants of the Lausanne Conference in 1922, those that sat at the negotiating tables or those that were not given formal accreditation, but were still informally present, to make their voices heard. They all had different answers to these questions. And I believe this shows once again why the term parallax is quite fitting to understand 1922. I agree with Yorgos that there was a certain continuity in the post-war peace settlement from Paris to Genoa and Lausanne. I'll come to that later. But at the same time, Lausanne had a unique quality. It was unusual and even bizarre because, among other things, it was negotiated and settled between the victors of the Great War of 1914-1918, the Allied powers, and the victor of the War of 1919-1922, Turkey. So Lausanne was a victor's peace and also a moment of amnesty one that was granted not only to the Turks, but also an amnesty that the Turks, I'll say, granted to the Allied powers. What do I mean by it? By this, I mean an amnesty for more than a century long, uneven interferences in Ottoman lands as pursued by the Turks. The annexation of Ottoman lands and antagonisms of sorts on, on both sides. For more than a century, the perception of the alleged relative weakness of the Ottoman Empire vis-à-vis -vis its northern and western neighbours, and the question of how to deal with this weakness, the eastern question, brought about endless armed interventions on the part of European powers, interferences to create autonomous regions within Ottoman lands some of which were later annexed by one or another of the European Great Power. This period saw the first proxy wars in the Near East, the slow evacuation of occupying European armies, or unprecedented financial and legal control mechanisms, or what we may call the imperialism of the capitulations. It saw the opening of an entire empire to global liberal economy through symbolic violence. I wish I had more time to unpack this, but I'm just going to tell you the broader titles. And all this is to say that the Ottoman experience with the Eastern question was one of ontological insecurity, as the social scientists like to say. 
but I'm just a historian. So I prefer to use the word a deep seated syndrome, which is usually associated in the literature with the Treaty of Sev, a notorious treaty from a Turkish perspective. But the origins of the syndrome I speak of, in fact, date back at least to the late 18th century, as I argue in my last book, to the emergence of the Eastern question. And I believe this syndrome, the fear of foreign designs to partition Turkey or curb its development, lasts its, to this date and makes Turkey a society particularly hospitable to even the most ridiculous of conspiracy theories, like the nonsense postulation that Lausanne Treaty expires in 2023. No, it does not. But this was only one side of the coin. On the other side was an equally tragic history of mass violence on the Christian populations on Ottoman territories, for example. Violence perpetrated by the Ottoman imperial regime and certain subjects, violence perpetrated on the Greeks, Armenians, Assyrians, among others, in the decades that preceded Lausanne. It wasn't called genocide back then, not before the 1940s. And nor did the Ottoman Imperial elites call themselves empire back then, or imperator look in their native language. But regardless of its semi-colonization, the Ottoman Empire was also an empire, an imperial system of exploitation and violence, or as in the case of the 1910s, extreme violence. At Lausanne, there was also an Armenian delegation with the support of the Americans and partially of Britain, the Armenian delegation tried to bring the Armenian issue to the agenda of the conference. What was the Armenian issue? Their goal was to acquire an Armenian homeland somewhere in Eastern or Southern Anatolia so that the survivors of the genocide could return back, ready to forget, as one Armenian delegate put it, what happened in the recent past, the genocide. But for the Turkish delegation, an Armenian home in Anatolia was out of question. It was literally the first instruction of the Ottoman government to Ismet Pasha, the head of the Turkish delegation, who categorically rejected the plan. And then the Americans largely pulled their support from the Armenian coast when they offered the opportunity to enter into the Middle Eastern oil industry after the peace. All that imperial and nationalist violence was swiped under the carpet in 1922-23 when the two treaties of Lausanne were signed, one between Turkey and the Allied powers and the other between Turkey and the United States. So the parallax here was not only about how historical actors saw and experienced war and peace, it was also about how economic and financial considerations affected political and diplomatic decision-making processes and vice versa. I gave you just one example, but we can expand this into other domains and, and, and fields. For the victors and signatories of Lausanne, peace brought about amnesty, as I said, mutual amnesty. And I would say, maybe I'm not quite agreeing with Yorgos here, I would say it brought about the establishment of a new imperial order in the Near East and maybe in the world. In this new order, Turkey was to remain largely independent. The Straits did not quite bring about 100% independence for Turkey, the Straits issue. And Turkey was not delivered from its deep seated syndrome still. The Arab world remained under British and French mandates, which I believe marks one of the continuities from Paris to Lausanne. And the 1923 peace denied self-determination to those silenced or unheard voices at Lausanne. For them, the Lausanne peace meant the loss of their last hopes for the Armenians, Assyrians, and I believe Elizabeth will explain it a bit, for the Arabs, it was the moment of injustice for those who were displaced by the population exchange and who were unwelcome in their new environments, Lausanne meant losing their homes. So what is peace? If we come back to that question, well, that's a parallax. And given its uneven nature, the question, another question remains, how then has the Lausanne peace survived to this date? 
I believe that entails a discussion of its memory and framing in the Near East and the wider world, its implications for the Turkish, Greek and other political culture, which makes me double curious to see what other speakers have to say about it. Thank you. Thank you, Bell, uh, and Kalispera Yanni. We can't hear you at the moment. Can you hear me? We can now, yes, thank you. Yes. Hello, welcome from Ankara. Uh, good evening, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you this evening. And thanks to the Hellenic Observatory and the conveners for inviting me to this discussion. I will follow up on the very interesting points of uh, previous speakers to highlight the role of uh, the war and uh, the Lausanne uh, uh, arrangements, the Lausanne Treaty, on uh, shaping the fortunes and the lives of the millions of the Greeks and Turks that were affected by this. And in that respect, I think, as Ozan mentioned, uh, we may be not talking about a parallax because the, the, it's a very sad story for both sides. And if we consider, of course, the beginning of the population displacements back in the Balkan Wars or even before, like in the 18th, 19th century and so on and, and onwards, we'll be seeing a process whereby, as uh, René Hichon mentioned in uh, one of his uh, her works, uh, the unmixing of populations. Of course, this is very much typical in the context of uh, the decline of the imperial order and the rise of a nation state order. It's definitely a very painful process, especially for people and populations who have not become part of any nationalist project through their uh, sort of education experience or through their membership of different networks that developed in uh, the imperial context, of course, in the Ottoman Empire, but outside the borders of the Ottoman Empire, in the nation states that emerged in, in the Balkan Peninsula. And uh, in that respect, I think it's very important to, to highlight that uh, the war uh, that we've been uh, discussing is producing most of the population dis displacement that is going to be uh, kind of confirmed and ratified a few months later by the Greek-Turkish Population Exchange Agreement signed in Lausanne at, in January, not in, in July 1923. In that respect, uh, this uh, is something that, of course, nation states had pondered before. So the discussion about population exchanges were not introduced in the Lausanne conference. They were earlier. But of course, uh, the terms and the conditions of these uh, population exchange negotiations were different. We were talking about voluntary uh, exchange whereby property rights would be sort of respected and people would be able to sell their properties or transfer their property uh, where possible to their new home lands. Because of course, the logic of uh, con converting the Ottoman Empire into uh, a nation state and or expanding the borders of the of the kingdom of Greece against the Ottoman Empire required this degree of homogeneity. So in that respect, nationalist projects on both sides were not thinking differently. But of course, uh, the reality is that this transition uh, was very violent and very painful. And we talk about uh, hundreds of thousands of of uh, human losses, and of, we don't talk about the Armenian case and the Armenian genocide, which is a parallel story to the story we're describing here. So, of course, uh, I would also like to highlight the political consequences of this. So, we may be talking about the effect of this on the peasants and the uh, bourgeois populations of the Greek uh, minority in Asia, minority, the Turkish minority in in northern Greece, uh, the parts of Greece that uh, were annexed to the state following the Balkan Wars. But I think it's important to highlight that this event produced profound consequences in the politics of both countries. So this massive influx of one, at least 1.5 million refugees to Greece uh, transformed the population of the country. It uh, triggered uh, uh, so many social and political dynamics that contributed later, uh, for example, to the rise of the Greek Communist Party, to the Greek Civil War, and in many ways he has informed developments in Greek politics until today. 
On the Turkish side, I think there's a very interesting dimension we need to highlight. The fact that uh, there was this, by, uh, this division of uh, government. So there was the Istanbul government that signed the Serbian treaty, but was then sort of challenged by the uh, nationalists that were based in Ankara under Mustafa Kemal. To the extent that the Istanbul government took the on the kind of took the burden of addressing the Armenian genocide, sort of trying to open up uh, like a, a, a different relationship between the new Turkish state and what had happened in the late years of the Ottoman Empire. And this resulted in a situation whereby uh, this complete denialist position that was taken over by this uh, Kemalist government in Ankara was eventually transferred to the new Republic of Turkey. And in my opinion, at least this has contributed to several of the difficulties that Turkey has faced today to kind of to consider uh, its historical past and sort of what has transpired in the late uh, parts of the Ottoman history regarding, of course, the Christian minorities. But it also has addressed uh, a, a sort of the rise of a very, very exclusivist understanding about politics. So uh, liberalism has found no position in the Turkish public sphere and uh, this uh, monist understanding of history, uh, whereby it might be Kemalist or it might be a different uh, sort of monist understanding of Turkish history politics has become dominant and I think has become one of the most interesting uh, like uh, residuals kind of like uh, things that have remained with us until today when we talk about Turkish politics. And in, my, in, in that respect, I think uh, the victory in that war, uh, had it been for Greece, Greece could have been uh, uh, facing the responsibility of uh, reinventing itself as a Greek Turkish state. So because the number of Turkish population will be so big that the Greek nation state would have to reconsider itself. Of course, with the expulsion of the Turkish, uh, the Greek population from Turkey and the Armenian genocide before, Turkey didn't have to face this as far as, as the Christian population was concerned, but there was the Kurdish population that remained, that was of course fully supportive of the uh, Kemalist uh, and then Turkish nationalist uh, movement against the Greeks and the Armenians because their understanding was still a uh, confessional, like a religious one. But when the Turkish Republic uh, stood on its feet, the Kurds realized that they had no space, no position as equals in that new republic. So in that respect, uh, Kurdish question to some degree is uh, a result of Turkey's, uh, victorious Turkey's inability to address the question of diversity uh, on the basis not of an imposition from outside, but as a sort of a decision that should have been uh, a original one based on the decision on, of, of the Turkish civil societies and political elites. Of course, uh, the population exchange and the work has produced other consequences uh, as well. And uh, in the project that uh, uh, Professor Featherstone mentioned at the beginning in my presentation, home across, we're trying to explore the architectural and cultural footprint of the population exchange. So we're trying to, and this is a project based at Elia Mep, uh, run by Calliope Amigdal, was trying to look into how the population exchange has changed, transformed the Izmir region, so the Izmir province, Izmir itself and its vicinity, as well as Attica. These were two uh, provinces that were profoundly affected by the war and population exchange because Athens and Attica received hundreds of thousands of refugees from, uh, from Asia Minor. And Izmir, uh, which used to be the home for hundreds of thousands of Greeks, also received hundreds of thousands of refugees from uh, Greek Macedonia and from other Balkan provinces. So in that respect, we're trying to uh, highlight how this change, this profound change, uh, is uh, recorded in the buildings and the memories and the cultural life of, uh, of these uh, provinces. And I think that's a very good example of how Greek-Turkish cooperation can help shed light on a very bitter, very sensitive, but also very important part of our common history. So thank you very much. Thank you, Yanni, very much indeed. Uh, and let's uh, connect with uh, Washington.
and Elizabeth. Uh, good, good afternoon to those of you in Washington. Good evening to the rest of you in Europe. Um, and uh, well, yes, a later evening in Turkey. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you for inviting me to this conference. And especially, I exemplify, I think, your theme of parallax, since I do not directly study the Greek and Turkish war, but I study people who watched the war and the exchange very closely, and um, in contrast to the kind of world-making, at least nation-state-making, that the uh, Turkish and Greek governments were engaged in. The people I write about in research are those who saw this moment in 1922 as a moment of world breaking, if you will. I'm gonna show you a map very briefly because I've got idea a part of the world you might not uh, be familiar with. I'm gonna talk in my last book as mentioned earlier by Professor Featherstone is on the greater Syria, which, um, comprised at the time uh, the current states of Lebanon, Syria, Israel, Palestine, and Jordan, all right? And people who established, um, uh, the book is about people who established a state governing that region um, right after the war. I am going to, however, look at uh, what happened in 1922 between Greeks and Turks um, from the point of view of Gaza the very southwestern part of what we call Greater Syria, and the meetings of two peoples uh, who were uh, fighting in those battles alongside uh, the Turks on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, the British and their forces, right? This is, uh, there were three battles at Gaza. The final one ended in November of 1917. And one person I'm going to talk about representing the sort of plur pluralism of the Ottoman society and the world that uh, he lived in that would break was a man named Antoine Kerpe, whose family came way back when from Transylvania. Uh, Protestant Hungarians who, in fact, were very well disposed towards the Ottoman Turks situated in Constantinople. Uh, the Turks had given them refuge in their various battles against uh, Vienna and the domination of the Austrians over the Hungarians. Indeed, um, Antoine Kope's grandfather came and settled in Constantinople during the 1848 revolution, um, which swept across Europe, but included Austria-Hungary. All right. Um, the other people I'm going to talk about are Arabs who were present at Gaza and in the battles against the Ottomans leading up to the final fall of Damascus and Aleppo in 1918. Uh, these were people, now I'm gonna leave the screen there, there for um, your, uh, so you can just see me. Uh, these were people who in fact also were fighting to protect a world they knew from what they saw as the aggression of Western Europe. Uh, Antoine's family uh, felt that they lived in, if you can imagine the map I just showed you, a world we might call Middle Europe. It included Greece, it included the Balkans, it included Austria-Hungary, all the way up to Berlin. And uh, Antoine, uh, a young man at the outset of World War I, born in Istanbul, native speaker, however, of French, living in the European side of the city, of uh, the capital city, uh, joined up eagerly to fight on the side of the Turks to protect that civilized world of Middle Europe from the aggressions of a kind of capitalist uh, imperialism uh, that threatened his world from Western Europe. Likewise, the Arabs had at first fought on the side of the Turks, again, to protect their territories and their society from the depredations of European aggression. Uh, but by 1916-17, fearing, in fact, that the Ottomans would be unable to protect their lands, cut a deal, in the end, a very bad deal with the Allies, uh, that uh, if they switched sides, they would get an independent state. But on both sides, what they were fighting to defend was, in fact, a pluralistic society that was not as the Europeans would have it, a throwback to some primordial, pre-modern, unworkable 
uh, sort of imperial pluralism. In fact, these were people who had been very much involved in the development of constitutional liberalism. And here I make a, uh, a, you know, a gesture to my previous speaker who talked about, and those of you uh, about this moment as the death of liberalism and the victory of a kind of um, uh, less tolerant, uh, uh, exclusionary, uh, and unfortunately authoritarian style government in many cases. Uh, the Arabs watched the war in Anatolia um, with mixed feelings from Damascus, right? What they saw was the danger of the perpetuation of the kind of military dictatorship that had thrown them into the arms of the British. Uh, during the war, there was a huge famine in greater Syria and uh, the Turks were unable to assure bread, uh, basic sustenance to the civilians who lived there and nearly half a million people died. One out of six people died, all right? This was the context for taking the very risky move of jumping into the Allies' camp. Now, let me just give you a little bit of a story of how, there's, of how these two stories come together um, in um, a story that ends with world breaking, if you will, a story that ends with, yes, the drawing of both very definite legal lines who belongs to a state, who enjoys rights in that state, a kind of um, line demarcating a national membership overseen uh, as part of the treaty making process, but also a, a, you know, a demographic line. Uh, since the time of the Crusades, since the time of the rise of the first Arab empires and Islamic empires, uh, you know, there had always been people talking about Christian Europe versus Muslim Middle East, but that had never in fact existed in demographic reality until the population exchange. The dimension that I wanna underline in my uh, short time with you is the, that the underpinnings of creating a line by way of uh, population exchange put Christians into what was considered civilized Europe inside of polities that had the privilege to enjoy rights under international law. If you were not civilized in the legal system inherited from the 19th century, you did not enjoy such rights and you certainly did not have rights at the new League of Nations. The Arab Muslims had gone to Paris it, with the full intention of joining a new wider liberal world system as imagined and promised by Woodrow Wilson. This was not the invention of Woodrow Wilson by any means. Woodrow Wilson was only giving voice to what they had already expected, that the universal pretensions of, uh, of the French Revolution and its values taught in schools throughout the world would again now finally be uh, made available to people who had fought on the good side of the allies against tyranny, uh, the Kaiser and so on, right? So they, um, 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 I may, you know, we can talk about it in the uh, Q&A if you like, but just as a footnote, uh, the Arabs sent their representatives to the Paris Peace Conference in full expectation they could get those rights um, just as the peoples of the defeated Austro-Hungarian Empire claimed rights. Poland had, was created at the bit of Poles who uh, you know, claimed the right to sovereignty and self-determination. So had Czechoslovakia been created and so would uh, the uh, kingdom of the Southern Slavs, the future Yugoslavia. And so they used that same rhetoric in confidence that they would be treated the same because A, in 1914, they had been citizens of a sovereign country. They had not been colonial subjects in sub-Saharan Africa or uh, in uh, Pacific Islands, a subject to Germany or Japan or uh, you know, another defeated power. They were uh, sovereign people who had elected people to Congress and participated in a constitutional revolution in 1908. Second, their friends, many Arabs who had settled in the Americas, including the United States, knew that the American government recognized Syrians as white people and white people deserved rights, didn't they? But the question was, would Muslims get rights, 
all right? On the other hand, uh, my poor man, Antoine Croque, a man without a country, he would soon find out, also thought that he belonged in European society and would carry rights, um, and that his comrades in arms, the Turks, would recognize those rights. And so let me just give you uh, his little story um, in the few minutes. Oh, I don't have any minutes left. Uh, so I noticed uh, uh, in the one minute I'll give myself, if you don't mind. Antoine Croupet fought in the Third Battle of Gaza. Uh, he returned to Istanbul after the war. He joined, he married his Greek sweetheart and took a job on the Black Sea for a mining company. It would not be until 1927 when he was forced out of his job to make room for a Muslim Turk that he realized that he no longer lived in a pluralistic society uh, that would uh, guarantee tolerance and rights uh, to all inhabitants. Indeed, the Turkish government refused him citizenship, even though he himself had refused to be expelled by the Ottomans. I mean, long before the Turkish uh, Greek population exchange, every Ottoman, um, every Austrian and German soldier was expelled from Istanbul, but he hid in attics and basements because his people were the Ottoman Turks. They were uh, the people he grew up with and the people he knew. Um, uh, so Thank Antoine Coupe, yeah, I'll just wrap up, uh, would in, in the end himself find uh, himself displaced and uh, forced to migrate out of the region to the United States um, long after World War I. Meanwhile, may I just say the last closing, I'm sorry, I didn't time this right. The, um, the heirs to the Ara def defeated Arab state at Damascus, defeated by the French in 1920, in Palestine would see the reenactment of a population exchange, if you will, or at least the logic of it. And today we see the, uh, bis, bis, the, uh, bis, the uh, Gaza under siege as a, a, an open air prison camp in a virtual population state exchange. And we see uh, heirs to treaties and, and precedents set 100 years ago, Syrians forced out of a dysfunctional uh, government and society and rejected in Europe by and large, creating a crisis and uh, uh, you know, stripped of rights, much as their peers in Gaza have been as well. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, very much indeed. Uh, and uh, our final speaker, but uh, by no means least, uh, my uh, LSE colleague, Yaprak. Uh, we can't hear you, Yaprak. Yes, uh, because Thank I you. was all mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm going to share my screen and uh, because I have a PowerPoint presentation. I have it only uh, to time myself better. Um, thank you very much, first of all, for the organization of this brilliant event. Uh, I've learned so much from the previous speakers. Um, I need to start uh, out by saying that uh, I'm not an historian. Uh, I uh, work on uh, politics and international relations. And I would like to approach the Greco-Turkish war uh, from that perspective and from the perspective of collective uh, trauma and how collective trauma and the events uh, of uh, 1919 and uh, 1922 still in some respects uh, shape um, the conflicts in the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean. So I want to look at the implications uh, of um, the war uh, for current uh, politics. And I want to argue that uh, current conflicts that we hear so much about um, on the news media and uh, also recently have reasons beyond uh, hard power, economic interest or other types of national interest. And perhaps we can include the legacy of the Lausanne Treaty into the reasons uh, you know, behind um, the uh, conflicts in the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean, the, uh, the unresolved issues of the Lausanne Treaty. But beyond these, um, I believe that um, there is uh, also the important elements of the memory uh, of the wars uh, of the 19th century. So I'm talking about the wars between Greece and Turkey with the start of the Greek independence war from the Ottoman Empire in 1821, and finally culminating in the Greco-Turkish war of 1919. 
The photo that you uh, see here on the slide is, of course, uh, just one example of an incident when uh, Greece and Turkey came on the brink of war over the islands of Emir Kardak in 1996. Uh, but uh, this has been, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, quite, um, uh, it's, a, it's just an example of several uh, incidents like these, uh, like this one um, um, in the recent years. Uh, so we can think of uh, wars or the Greco-Turkish war um, as a collective trauma. Um, so uh, wars are indeed uh, collective traumas in the sense that they are horrible, shocking events uh, and they cause intense emotions uh, such as pain for a collective. But uh, wars uh, can also be thought of as events and, uh, you know, based on the definition of collective trauma in the literature as well. These are events that reveal that our sense of belonging uh, to a community and the security that we seek from that community are in fact misplaced. As Atkins, Hutchinson and others would argue, collective traumas and wars would dismantle our sense of belongings and would provide an opportunity to reconstitute uh, new identities and new ones. So with trauma, we rethink our communities and identities. And in that sense, the Greco-Turkish war, as we heard from the other speakers as well, gave the opportunity of nation building um, to these uh, uh, communities and uh, allowed them and forced them to rethink their communities and identities. Uh, also, collective pain occurs through such traumatic events um, uh, like wars, um, and they become the means uh, with which we form new surfaces and uh, borders. And these shared memories uh, of pain uh, and borders and border making are passed down to generations who continue to remember the pain and maintain the collective identity as it was uh, usually reconstituted by those who were in power. So, um, uh, identities, new identities, new borders, new surfaces are usually um, shaped by those who are in power and then they are commemorated and remembered through the lens of those who were in power. Vamuk Volkan uh, consider the, considers uh, these types of traumas as uh, chosen uh, traumas. So nations remember uh, past traumas um, and um, they remember how their nations were built and they remember uh, these traumas and nation building. In the case of Greece and Turkey, more than anything else, it was the collective trauma of their wars and conflicts with each other in the early 20th century that constituted their current collective identities. This is, of course, a glorified self-identification that hides away their own violence and atrocities during these years. It is also a reminder of uh, who the other that caused the pain is, putting the blame of the wars almost entirely on the other, which is demonized and still perceived in a negative light. In this sense, and um, as uh, covered uh, by the literature on Greek-Turkish relations quite extensively, Greek and Turkish identities were constituted against one another. Through negative perceptions of each other, the two nations can remember who they are. Therefore, current day hostilities and disputes in the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean are also a useful tool to create a rally around the flag effect imbued with hypernationalism. And without this aspect of the conflict sorted, without the memories of the trauma properly assessed, um, it is unfortunately case, the case that we will we will probably be able to find the solution to these chronic disputes. So just to very quickly go over, you know, how the Greeks narrate their own uh, collective identity vis-a-vis -vis, um, Turkey and the Ottoman past. And um, so, of course, this is an exaggerated, slightly exaggerated and a stereotypical, uh, you know, um, depiction of Greek collective identity. And uh, please bear with me um, in the remaining two minutes. This is the only thing that I can do. Um, so according to Greek uh, collective uh, identity, this is a nation uh, of at least uh, 3000 years. Modern Greeks are the direct descendants of the ancient Greeks. 
and importantly, um, through the Byzantium Empire. So the descendants of the uh, they're the uh, descendants of the ancient Greeks through the continuation of the Byzantium Empire. But then that empire was dismantled by the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople in 1453. So the collective identity of the Greeks and their nation were broken by the Turkish yoke. And quite importantly as well, Greece was separated from its European origins by the Turkish yoke as well. So um, Turkey in that sense is a long-term uh, enemy. And this shapes, of course, Greek perceptions of Turkey as well. Um, so from this perspective, um, Turks uh, are neo-Ottomans and they have expansionist visions. So currently this expansionism means dividing the Aegean, encapsulating the Greek islands, controlling Cyprus, and perhaps even invading Greek Thrace from the land border. Here is a cartoon. I mean, there are so many cartoons like this, but this is from a mainstream um, right-wing newspaper, Katimerini's English version, depicting um, um, uh, Erdogan as uh, the Ottoman Sultan with expansionist uh, visions. And of course, uh, Behind this type of understanding is the belief that Turks are aggressive and are always prepared for an offensive. Again, behind this understanding is the stereotypical understanding of the Turk as an uncivilized barbarian. Uh, but until very recently, we should also include the international dimension to this understanding that the Turks have been supported and overlooked. Uh, by the US or their aggressiveness were overlooked by the US. This is changing in the recent um, years, but that has been the general understanding. Now, in terms of Turkish collective identity, the Turks view the Ottoman Empire as tolerant toward other religious communities. So they don't remember the, of course, uh, the Ottoman Empire um, in this negative uh, light um, that the Greeks uh, uh, have. And uh, modern Turkey then, uh, as the continuation of the Ottoman Empire in this case, is a bridge between the East and the West. And Turks today are tolerant and understanding, especially toward the Muslims and others who are repressed and discriminated against by the West and, and the Christians. So it's part of Turkish identity to be tolerant and understanding of the repressed in world politics. Now, Turkish perceptions of Greece reflect the Megali idea of the 19th century, the state ideology of the Greek nation state at the time to unite all Greek speaking populations or the imperialist divisions uh, of Greece, as we've uh, heard about from the previous speakers. And uh, the belief that the Greeks still have this type of vision uh, and they want to turn the Aegean into a Greek lake, landlock uh, Turkey, uh, unite with Cyprus, which they have tried in the past, but failed. Now they're doing that through the EU. And more importantly, and most importantly, the Greeks are the spoiled uh, children of Europe and the West. Here's the cartoon that depicts this understanding of Greece from the Turkish perception. So in summary, the uh, memory of the war, uh, the wars uh, of the 19th century and early 20th century uh, has shaped Turkish and Greek identities and their perceptions of one another. Uh, however, um, and I want to end on this uh, optimistic note, uh, collective trauma and war are not only the chosen traumas of the Greeks and the Turks or um, the chosen traumas of the Greeks versus the Turks. It is also a shared memory of history and pain. And this shared memory can actually be utilized and remembered um, so that the two nations can understand each other better. Thank you. Thank you, Yafrak, very much indeed. Uh, I'm conscious of the time because we're scheduled to finish at eight. And I know that some people are watching online and you can send us your questions uh, online and I'll be able to read them uh, here on the screen in front of me. And we also have uh, a number of people uh, who may like to comment and ask questions uh, here, but we've, uh, had, I think, a very good uh, tour of the various uh, issues and dimensions of uh, this uh, conflict. We've heard about the legacies of liberal internationalism, uh, whether these events were world-making or world-breaking. Uh, we've heard about uh, these events and the othering 
aspect of uh, national identity, uh, the inability of each side to recognize their own internal uh, diversity. Um, I think uh, Yanis referred to René Hershon's uh, notion of the unmixing of uh, populations. And we started off with Ozan's basic question of what is peace? And uh, we've finished with uh, Yaprak talking about the legacies of the Treaty of Lausanne and these particular events uh, as structuring subsequent bilateral relations. So that is a hell of a lot of issues for us to, uh, to consider. And uh, let me uh, simply open up immediately to the audience uh, here or online. And we've got a number of contributions. Uh, can you just say who you are, Vasily? Am I? Yes, you are now. Vasilis Marciotis from the Hellenic Observatory LSC. Uh, so I don't know who I'm addressing the question to, but it's just kind of a collection of, of, of thoughts. You focused all, all the speakers actually, <clears throat> excuse me, on this kind of the population exchange as something that kind of homogenized and created, you know, moved from the imperial oh. past to, to the creation of the nation state uh, uh, in both Turkey and what is now Turkey and what is now uh, Greece. Um, and then we have that less effectively in the other parts of the Ottoman Empire. Um, but of course, the nation state has these two, two dimensions. One is kind of maximize the difference with the other, uh, but also homogenize internally. Uh, can we say, there was a mention that uh, Turkey was less successful in, you know, resolving the Kurdish or integrating the Turkish and also other uh, populations in, the, in its uh, territory. Um, can we say that part of the, of the, of the uh, kind of the, the, the modernization, the, how successfully the modernization program is uh, evaluated and who belongs to the West and who is in the East and the barbarians and the uncivilized and all these things has to do with how effective the internal homogenization project uh, was. Because in Greece, it, I, I mean, you know, you know anecdotally of stories that it was painful, but it, it became very effective. And then we reached the point where every, like 99% of the population in Greece thought that they are direct descendants of the uh, the ancient Athenians. Uh, whereas in Turkey, uh, as I understand it, that's not at all the case. Okay, I'm hoping that our speakers joining us online have heard that question. Yes, okay, that, that's good. I wonder, Ozan, if you'd like to uh, begin by addressing that question? If you could unmute yourself. Yes, of course. Uh, so if I understood correctly, the question was how effective the modernization program was evaluated and internal homogenization, how successful would, has it been in con contemporary Turkey? Um, I mean, what, what, what are the criteria here? I think that is the uh, counter question that I might need to raise. And how Turkish political culture has been shaped since the 1920s. So a quick pointer also to the other speakers here. In Turkey, in the 1920s and 30s, the most authoritarian figures, even those that were flirting with fascist ideas like Recep Peker, considered themselves as liberals. Mm -hmm. They were politically liberal, economically not. Morally, well, let's not go into that. And this liberal model was based on the premise of a, a nationalist communitarian understanding. It drew inspiration from Turkheimian ideas to an extent. Of course, Islamic thought also played a considerable role there. And they wanted to create this collective consciousness among the Turks. Everyone was supposed to be equal. It has to be a classless society and ethno-religious differences, aside from the minorities, meaning non-Muslims, they did not exist. Everybody was Turk. And also by constitution, according to 1924 constitution, which was one of the first points that would antagonize the Kurds and would lead to a series of uprisings and of course, mass violence from 1920s onward. So if you look at the current day paradigms, discussions in Turkey, jumping from 1920s to today, how the, the um, arguably more liberal 
uh, political parties in Turkey, like the um, HDP that is more tolerant to, uh, to, to diverse communities, ethno-religious communities, how they are seen as a threat to mainstream narratives and political cultures. We see that there has been a considerable degree of homogenization of Turkish mentality, Turkish political culture, into thinking about Turkish society through the parameters of Turkishness, Sunni, or being Sunni, or ethno-religiously speaking, and the other ethno-religious identities, be it Alevi or Kurdish, have usually been seen through that lens of what I previously called syndrome as threats as foreign machinations to upend right. or, okay. or, or, or curb Turkey's development. So this okay. is a big question with a big answer. I'll stop okay. here. Thanks, thanks Ozan. Uh, let's uh, bring other people in. Uh, Yanni, I wonder you're in the uh, unique position of, of uh, studying identity questions and bilateral uh, relations. Vasilis's question uh, posed the point about uh, internal homogenization issues and the consequences for bilateral relations. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Well, I think that Vasilis' comment is pertinent because there is a different story in, the, in both cases. In the case of Greece, we can argue that homogenization has been more successful, but I think this is also due to the size, the fact that Greece was defeated and it, its population uh, maybe more than 25% of population uh, came from uh, Turkey as refugees. So this allowed for the state to pursue a more successful uh, homogenization project. In the case of Turkey, the fact that Turkey won the war and maintained this uh, huge land as the territory of the Republic of Turkey, despite all these uprootings and genocides and expulsions and massacres, there was still quite considerable degree of diversity. And although we can argue that the Kemalist project appeared to be largely successful, it integrated millions of Turks, uh, new people of diverse identities into the modern Turkish nation, there was a sizable part of the Kurdish population mainly that refused to join this path. And this has been one of the essential problems that Turkey has been facing throughout its history. In that respect, uh, uh, we can argue that this, this problem still shapes uh, the inability of Turkey's uh, democracy today to address uh, okay. uh, the, the Kurdish question. So in that respect, uh, and we can even argue that all these discussions not now and this Erdogan's attempt to provide a counterweight to Ataturk and sort of provide an alternative vision of Turkishness is also a very interesting uh, kind of challenge to the success of the Kemalist modernization project. Thank you, Yanni, very much indeed. Uh, can I just check, do we have Michael Llewellyn-Smith online? I think you would like to make a comment on Greek collective identity in relation to the Greek-Turkish war. Is that correct? So if, yes, Michael Llewellyn-Smith is joining us on screen, can you, Unmute yourself, Michael, please. Whilst we're waiting for Michael, uh, George, do you want to make a comment? Okay, so j jump in with two very brief comments uh, from the discussion. And so one point I just wanted to make, I kind of come back to this and it was mentioned. Indeed, the population exchange you know, convention uh, happens early on in the story meaning uh, early 2020, uh, 1923. Well, we shouldn't forget that these kinds of uh, things we're talking about now, treaties and things are processes and they're processes and they take time. And what also takes time is what happens after the signs, uh, the, the, the treaties are signed. There's great wealth of material in the League of Nations archives where you have League of Nations bureaucrats trying to manage what's going on. And it's like great for the researcher there to see that material and, and quick point on that, also what is a process is that, you know, Rene mentioned the book as unmixing, 
But the term mixing, it's interesting to note, has actually a very interesting prehistory and it's being used again and again in the 19th century by imperial observers when they encounter national problems. And they think of unmixing as a method of solving questions. And that takes us to, to the treaties. Yeah. We try to solve questions in the treaties, but there are always questions unsolved that come up. Okay, thank you. I think we do now have Michael. We can, uh, can you hear us, Michael? Yeah, I can. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, uh, go ahead. Right, thank you very much. I was reflecting on what uh, the last speaker said about collective trauma and collective memory. And wondering in the Greek case uh, about the political effects of the exchange of populations and the end of the war between Greece and Turkey. And the immediate effect of the end of the war was to actually sharpen the divisions between uh, members of different political parties in the Greek political world, uh, very much so, so that for many years, um, the effects of this increased division and hatred between uh, the Venizelis and the non-Venizelis, the royalists or whatever you like to call them, uh, was a not just a problem, but a, a, a major feature of the Greek political scene. And I'm not sure when it came to an end, but um, perhaps after the Second World War. Uh, and this uh, can be distinguished, I think, from the effects of the exchange of populations on the um, those who were exchanged, although of course they were very much affected by the politics and the politicians were very much affected by their fate. Uh, but I just wanted to draw attention to it because it's a, an aspect which hasn't really been considered uh, during this seminar, but it is itself of considerable importance, I think. Thank you, Michael, very much indeed. Let's uh, move on with other questions. We have the gentleman here. Could you put the, your microphone on here, please? No, no we, we, people want to hear online as well. Just press the button and it goes red. Your Just head. keep it pressed, yes? Yep. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me... It's pressed. Okay. Can you hear me all? We can yeah. hear you. Go okay. Ahead. Um, all right, okay, right. Uh, it's very interesting that what you said about uh, all those events. It is pushing, it's red here. It needs to remain okay. red so we can hear you. It is red. I've got my finger and it's oh, red. Excellent. It is now, it's yes, red all ahead. the time. No, <laughs> go ahead. Okay, right. You're correct in saying that uh, all those events are interlinked, they're not isolated, and you mentioned. Um, um, uh, the Russian Civil War, of course, and uh, but all the, the Treaty of Severa and all that, they're all interlinked. I would like, just like to add, without um, being critical, obviously, it's just a mere observation, so, so don't mis mis misconstrue what I'm, what I'm saying is the Russian Revolution as well should be mentioned and, with, and, and the Treaty of Presley Trust without uh, wanting to digress. And you're also correct in saying it goes back to 1812, in 1912 with the the Balkan Wars, which again, it, that led to the, the First World War or whatever. But if you allow me, please, uh, one could perhaps argue we could go back to the Treaty of Berlin in 1878, which in effect was the beginning of the carving of the Ottoman Empire, because Cyprus was ceded to the British Empire and parts of Bulgaria were ceded, taken away from the... Um, from, from the Ottoman Empire as well. The one thing I like to say, the Treaty of Severa was not favorable to the Ottoman Empire, uh, but the Treaty of Lausanne was. And, and, and there is a historical reason for that, is because the main European imperialisms, um, the, uh, France and Britain, they were afraid, with also the, the Americans pushing them as well, with the Russian Revolution, what they were afraid of if Turkey 
had leaned and go, went towards uh, Russia and the creation in 1922 of the, of the, of the Soviet Union. And, and why do I say that? Because from 1920 to 1922, Bolshevik Russia supplied arms and about 200 kilograms of gold ingots to, to the Grand National Assembly, as you're well aware. Okay, and, and in March 1921, there was the Treaty of Moscow, which was signed by Bolshevik Russia and the Grand National Assembly. So I will just finish and say, you said that the only treaty in existence of that period is Lausanne. The Treaty of Moscow yeah. is still in existence to this day because okay. it was Bolshevik Russia. Thank just you. to let's finish. Uh, thank you. Let's uh, okay. uh, invite George to respond. Oh, oh so, yeah, no, I, I, I just I just agree with the gist of it. Oh, sorry. Am I, I think we can hear me, no? Okay, good. Yeah, so I, I agree with the gist of it, indeed. And there's actually 1922, another interesting point, very briefly. And we have the beginnings of a very interesting uh, Turkish-Soviet-Russia relationship that focuses on economy and trade. And it has been understudied in some ways, actually. Uh, and, 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 yeah, I mean, I, you know, I agree. You have agreement. Okay. Uh, other qu uh, questions or contributions? Then, uh, uh, can... Please. Uh, uh, Yannis, please. Uh, Yannis Unity, Tufts University, visiting the LSE. Uh, my question is uh, uh, factual, actually. In Greece, there's an enormous uh, popular interest in the, uh, uh, in, in the 1922 uh, 100 years. Uh, in Turkey, there is a huge political uh, you know, part of this, but is it a popular interest uh, in 1922? That's my question. Ozan, do you want to come in on that question? Or Yafrak? I mean, yes, I can, but I need to say that you're asking questions that need to be addressed to political scientists to me while Yafrak is here, as in the previous okay, question. Okay, yeah. But so very shortly, one brief answer. A couple of days ago, one of the uh, most popular football teams in Turkey, their supporters had this long march in one of the main streets of Istanbul to start celebrating 1922, and the proclamation of the Republic in 1923. So it is considered as this long part to the Republic 1922, and it is being popularly celebrated. Okay, so we have two political scientists we can call. Mm -hmm. uh, firstly, uh, let's ask uh, uh, Yanis and then Yafrak. Yanni, can you unmute? Question. In Greece, population exchange and the legacy of population exchange has become a very important part of the Greek public memory and public discourse already from the 1950s and 60s. And there has been a very great interest in the culture, in the music, in the food of uh, Anatolian uh, refugees and Thracian refugees. And they have contributed profoundly to the Greek, modern Greek identity. In Turkey, there hasn't been such a, an equivalent process. I think because of the fact that uh, Republican Turkish identity uh, decided to forge Anatolia into the Turkish homeland. So these stories had to be forgotten so that everybody becomes a sort of a Republican Turkish citizen. So references to the past, references to these uh, very bitter and uh, traumatic experiences were kind of uh, reduced. It's only recently, and I refer to the last 20, 30 years maybe, that refugee associations from uh, Greece, from Bulgaria, from other parts of the Balkans tried to claim their position in the Turkish national identity. What Professor Yanidis mentioned, though, is the use of the Lausanne Treaty for political purposes in the kind of uh, in a kind of shadow battle between uh, Erdogan and Ataturk. So commenting on Lausanne, in my opinion, has to do more with the domestic political dynamics in Turkey because uh, the Treaty of Lausanne has been considered to be the birth certificate of Republican Turkey and evidence for the success of the Kemalist uh, movement. Well, now there is some critique to that, that the Lausanne was not so good after all, and there were all these territories that were lost, so let's uh, think about it again and let's do something better. So in a sense, 
Uh, this is referring, though, to domestic political competition in Turkey and the attempt of uh, Tayyip Erdogan to emerge as a counter uh, way to Kemal Ataturk in the Turkish political competition. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, Frank. Um, yeah, uh, the uh, uh, 100th year uh, of uh, the anniversary of um, Izmir's liberation uh, was celebrated uh, with a series of events. There was a concert uh, by a very popular singer, uh, which was attended uh, by, I don't know how many, but huge crowds and partying on the streets of Izmir. Um, so for Izmir 1922 uh, was definitely important and something to celebrate. But because of the political climate and the polarization that Turkish politics currently has, um, of course, all of these like celebrations have um, other meanings. And so I think the question uh, was uh, very well uh, put. So it, it doesn't become something that homogenizes the Turkish um, uh, public. And in that sense, you know, the celebrations in Izmir were almost also like a protest uh, to the current uh, government. Uh, and at the same time, um, I would like to stress that in public memory, currently at least, 1923 uh, overshadows uh, the Lausanne uh, Treaty and the victory of the Greco uh, Turkey War. 1923 is, of course, the birth of the Turkish Republic. And uh, there is almost a separation of 1923 from Lausanne. So the discourses around the Lausanne Treaty are completely separate than the discourses, almost almost completely separate than the discourses around 1923, which is, which is you know, um, celebrated, uh, but not necessarily questioned as much as Lausanne. Thank you, Yaprek, very much. Um, I'm going to take a written question, which is sent to us from a PhD student at Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts, Hussein Kurt. Uh, and I'm just reading this for the first time. Uh, my question is for all, but particularly to professors uh, Ozan uh, and Yaprak. It's a little bit speculative, a little bit speculative. Do you think if the Turkish nationalists had come up with a more inclusive new national identity, based on the territorial notion of Anatolia and being Anatolians among the Muslim inhabitants of the country by 1922, how feasible would it be to unite the population successfully and create a politically stable state apparatus instead of ethnic as well as constructed Turkishness? Did Kemalists consider such an identity at all? Would they find it realistic enough given the deep-seated syndrome going on for more than a century in the Near East, as Professor Ozan, as Ozovci uh, mentioned. Ozan, do you want to comment on that? Yes, I love counterfactual questions because they just make you think and that's the only chance we can rewrite history. <laughs> there were moments like this blue Anatolianism that they uh, wanted to promote the idea of Anatolianness rather than Turkishness in Turkey. It was a more inclusive, relatively more inclusive discourse, not something uh, embraced by the Kemalists, however. Um, and I would say, yes, a more inclusive Anatolian identity would, in the first place, possibly not antagonize the Kurds from 1924-25 onward, it would not lead to this Sheikh Said rebellion, the, the, the death in massacre or, or, or all these oppressions. Possibly the minorities living in Turkey from 1920s onwards, the non-Muslims as the minorities were considered at the time, would not suffer as much possibly. It would be a much more ideal scenario. But the Kemalists, no, they did not really think about it. And I do think the reason that they uh, embraced Turkish nationalism, yes, it was partly the syndrome. They did look at other examples. If you look at the birth of Turkish nationalism, it's pioneering figures like Yusuf Aktura, Ahmed Agayev, or Rizia Gokay. You see that they are taking example of what happened in other countries, mainly the Russian Empire and homogenization there. 
both Hagayev and Rusev Arctura Octarine were originally from the Russian Empire, and their conception of nationalism was actually not as inclusive, even though in some of their writings they would argue otherwise. In practice, uh, that, that was a much different story. This is a counterfactual question. Thank you very much. It's a good one, but it will be a better world for Turkey, I would say. Okay, thanks. Uh, Yafrak, do you want to just briefly add a, a comment? Yeah, just quickly. I mean, I, I feel like we it's 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 difficult uh, to make these types of um, you know arguments um, with the hindsight that we have, and we should be very careful criticizing past leaders, and we should really judge them based on the context that they were in. And I think at the time, uh, this this uh, was pro probably the only possibility because the context was nation building. I mean, this is what we discussed. And then I want to go back to the first question um, that Vasilis asked. And there was another question, a, a comment actually from Michael uh, Llewellyn Smith. And um, I think they both point out uh, to the important dynamic of what do we mean by homogenization? So it's, is it homogenizing uh, the ethnic communities in that respect? Perhaps Greece was more successful, but then there is also homogenizing ideologically. And so both nations struggled in terms of like this ideological homogenization, which is not ideal at all, but they, this is what they tried to do as well after the war um, too. So even if this new Anatolian national identity were to be created, which I think was quite impossible in the context of the time, there wouldn't have been ideological homogeneity as the Kemalists attempted. Um, that did not really happen, uh, despite their attempts. And we have, um, you know, splinter parties, and then after, um, you know, um, a few decades, uh, the Democrat Party, and so on and so forth. So homogenization doesn't happen. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Previously, you'd ended on an optimistic note, but thank you, Yabrek. This um, was an optimistic <laughs> note. <Kevin>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, so uh, I'm conscious of the uh, the time, and uh, what I'd like to do is just to go around each of our sp uh, speakers, if I may, and just give you uh, one very brief uh, opportunity to uh, reflect on the discussion that we've had and what you would like us to take away in particular from uh, from the discussion. I'm conscious, that, uh, Elizabeth, we haven't imposed any question on you, so would you like to go first? Sure, no problem. Thank you. I think my one takeaway would be this. I mean, we, um, we're all struggling in a world today where um, it seems like liberal democracy is under siege. And um, although the suffering of the hundreds of thousands involved in the exchange and uh, those who died in the war uh, remain important legacies, a, a, as important in my mind is the fact that the Turkish representatives at Lausanne did not stand up for inclusion of non-Christians in the um, so-called world of civilized nations who um, enjoy rights um, within that. The, uh, the Turks eventually uh, position themselves as somehow secular Europeans, if you will, um, leaving uh, Kurds, Arabs, others, uh, Indian Muslims, and so on today in a degraded status of um, uh, enjoying any kind of rights uh, in the world, um, uh, they played into the unfortunate racial politics of the moment. And um, when we look at what's happening in Gaza, when we're looking at what's happening with the Syrian refugees, and unfortunately, the backlash against them, understandable in Turkey today, nonetheless, um, that moment created a whole reservoir of peoples who did not enjoy rights and still don't a century later. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Very important points. Uh, that's a great final comment. Uh, Yanni. When the Lausanne Treaty highlighted the prevalence of state interest against human rights, so states established their own homogeneous uh, uh, populations. They tried to pre prioritize nation building over property rights, over the decision of the people to live where they were born. 
And that was considered to be a great success, where a century later, I think we've considered, we've advanced our understanding of this and human rights have been considered to be a priority. Although in practice, we see that this doesn't always apply. It is important to keep that in mind because we still witness around us uh, wars and situations where people get uprooted and people lose uh, their rights. And uh, it is important to consider this when we uh, witness new tragedies around us. And we need to consider the importance of protecting humans over state interests. Thank you very much. Uh, Yaprak? Yeah, uh, my uh, key point is um, that we shouldn't find ourselves in a competition uh, of past traumas and uh, competition of pain, whose pain was uh, more painful. Um, let's not judge the past with our current understandings and uh, let's learn from the past uh, mistakes and uh, find ways to sh share our sorrows for a better future. Thank you very much indeed. Ozan? Well, Yabrex was so nice. Um, I can say maybe we need to go back, also think about 1822, while we are thinking about 1922. There was a Greek revolution, Greek war of independence there, massacres, violence at the time, Michigan massacres, but whatever, you, a massacre is a 19th century term though. In 1922, we talked about a similar story, where in 2022, and we are talking about how important it is to think about pain, reconceptualize pain. But at the same time, we should not forget the fact that historical context is important, but within co that context, humans had options to choose in one way or another. Massacre was not the only choice or violence wasn't the only choice. And the fact that people have gone through syndromes and pains of sorts can as well be utilized for political ends today as they are being done through the Treaty of Lausanne, how it is being used as an instrument, weaponized to incite uh, antagonistic sentiments, especially on the part of the Erdogan regime. So I think it's something that we need to be careful. Yes, we need to learn from history, but we shouldn't also leave ourselves to the complacency of thinking that people had to act in a certain way because historical context dictated it. That wasn't the case. And one small note, the Ottoman Empire started to be carved out not from 17, 1878 onward, as one of the speakers said, that goes back to late 18th century, to the at least to the Greek project of 1780s, the project of Catherine the Great. That's my final words. Thank you. And let's uh, finish with the originator of the panel, uh, Yogo. Thanks. Well, I mean, everyone's spoken so eloquently, really. I, I don't really want to add anything more other than say just an angle, you know, thinking about treatises and processes, we tend to think even today in international politics on how to solve questions, right? And we tend to, you know, conceptualize things in terms of questions that seek solutions. And then we try to apply solutions. And I think if we really go as a historian, as putting my historian said, if we go back in that moment of time, the Lausanne moment in time, then we'll find, you know, where, you know, how territories, how populations are being weaponized in an effort to solve territorial problems, but problems that the solutions imposed demonstrate that they can never be solved. So that's why we're talking about the Lausanne Treaty today, and we'll be talking with about treaties like this for a long way to come. We just need to receive the way we conceptualize national problems and the kinds of solutions we apply for them as an international community, as, as an international politics anyway. So I'll end it here, I guess. Okay, uh, before I thank each of our speakers, can I just uh, mention that, of course, this evening's discussion is being recorded and will be available as a podcast and a video on the website of the Hellenic Observatory, on Facebook, and on uh, YouTube. Uh, the Hellenic Observatory's next research seminar will be this uh, coming uh, Tuesday, and that is uh, Professor Sofia Vassilopoulou, Professor of European Politics at King's College uh, London, who will be uh, speaking about Political Trust and Satisfaction with Democracy in Greece in Comparative Perspective, 
uh, to 2020. So do please join us at six o'clock next Tuesday. Yes, yeah, six o'clock uh, next Tuesday. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and again, just before thanking our speakers, uh, we're inviting everyone uh, who has joined us here for a wine reception outside so we can continue uh, the discussion. Uh, there has to be some cost of joining us virtually, and I'm afraid uh, that is it. Uh, we won't be sending you a case of uh, wine because we couldn't actually agree on the ethnicity of the wine that we should be uh, sending you. But uh, thank you to each of you who have joined us online and George. <laughs>